APU. American Public University is proud to present Exploring STEM. My name is Dr. Bjorn Mercer, and today we are talking to Dr. Kevin Harris, Program Director in the School of STEM. And our conversation today is about cybersecurity. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, looking forward to it. Excellent. I uh, know I'm excited about this conversation. Um, I know very little about cybersecurity, so I'm really um, very interested in the topic and uh, really about the depth of uh, what cybersecurity is. So to jump into the first question, can you provide a brief overview of cybersecurity and also how is it different from other IT fields? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's one that's changed over time. So my background is infrastructure so worked in the IT space in networking and then in security kind of before it became labeled as cyber is what we think of today. And we've gone through and, you know, several different changes. So what does cyber look like? And so we really think about cybersecurity, protecting data, protecting digital assets um, that individuals have, that companies have, and so how to protect it. And so that's the wide range of fields that go with that. It's the technical work that's done to protect it, but also the policy and legal implications behind it. And so we're just broadly talking about protecting assets, digital information or data that an organization has. That's broadly what we're talking about with cyber. And I think a lot of times individuals focus on, you know, the really highly technical portion of it. And so you talk about how is it different from other IT fields. And I think really it's a part of other IT fields. So a lot of times when people think about, are they going to look at the IT field as a potential degree path or career opportunity? They immediately think of of coding. A lot of times that might have been the first exposure they had to tech, whether it was in elementary or middle school, high school. And so that's the initial thoughts of coding. And then from there, maybe networking. But security and cybersecurity is kind of integrated into all those fields. So if you're developing code, it should be done in a secure manner. If you're implementing a network architecture, there's a ways that you can develop it with more of a focus on security versus prioritizing certain traffic. So cybersecurity is a broad field and really, I'd say it's part of all the other IT fields. So I guess that was my long answer to say that, that cyber is, uh, you know, just a portion of the kind of subset of all the other IT fields. And that's great. Uh, my follow-up question is, and I'm glad you brought up coding, is cybersecurity both, it includes software, and does it also include hardware? Now, I ask that question because obviously nothing can exist without hardware, but obviously coding is part of software and different things like that. Some of this has kind of came up in the news lately about restrictions from certain telecom companies, the equipment that they are allowed to ship in. And for the longest, the assumption was made that if a piece of hardware, whether it's a switch, a router, a computer, if you purchase it and you unwrap the shrink wrap, that it was safe because it was brand new and that meant it was safe. But because of the uh, really nature of where a lot of hardware is built, you know, the question comes into, could it be a possibility that a piece of hardware could be compromised before it was even shipped to a user? And so those questions come up. That's one way that hardware comes into the cybersecurity question. And a lot of times the other issue when it comes into hardware is, is an individual using the hardware or piece of equipment that's been purchased in a manner that it was actually intended. Sometimes maybe organizations might try to save money on purchasing a router that was uh, spec'd out for bandwidth at a certain level of traffic, and their organization uses more bandwidth than that device was spec And so, yes, possibly can it work, but what are some of the security implications of um, the bandwidth um, exceeding the amount of resources that was allocated to that device. So hardware is definitely part of that, I guess, formula, if you will. Now to continue with, I guess you can say the hardware question, are Alexas a cybersecurity threat? <laughs> or are they mainly just a privacy threat? 
Yeah, and it depends on uh, how you look at that. You know, uh, is that the same? You know, if, um, our data is a huge part of what we're trying to save. And so when you talk about a privacy threat and there's the potential that someone is giving up access to their data. So to me, that is definitely a cyber threat. And another thing is just the number of devices, every device that you have on your network, whether it's your corporate network or at home on your home network, is a potential for that device to be compromised. And then someone use that device to jump to another device on your network. So it's opening an additional kind of um, hole into your network. And so you have to make that decision that, you know, is it something that you really want to do is add these extra devices, as well as making sure that each of those extra devices that you add, you stay on top of the updates. When they're updated, are they patched? If that device then becomes obsolete to the point to where it may still work, but maybe the vendor that's supporting that no longer supports that particular device. And so they're not issuing security patches or not issuing any type of software updates to that device. And so you staying on top of that as the user says, OK, well, I need to purchase a new device, not because my current device isn't working, but because I'm no longer receiving updates. And so there are vulnerabilities. And so it's kind of risk versus reward situation of how many devices and in what manner you implement them on a home network. That totally makes sense. And especially with home networks, just to think how many devices now and very soon will be on a home network besides an Alexa, uh, besides a garage door opener, besides uh, <laughs> um, your air conditioner can all be on a network, including your refrigerator. <laughs> It seems a little silly why you'd want a smart refrigerator, but I guess people want it. I was at the store recently and I saw a Wi-Fi enabled crock pot. So I, I thought immediately I've never, you know, used a crock pot and said, you know, if I could only have controlled moving that temperature from the other room or before I got home, it would change my total experience uh, with the crock pot. I, I asked myself the same question is, you know, what is the purpose other than you can and so it's definitely a lot of devices that can be on a network. I talked with a colleague recently, and he's in the security space, and he says he was scanning his network just to do a periodic check, and he found about 40 devices connected to his network. And so he was concerned about had somebody compromised his network. And after he got to doing a little digging, he realized that, no, he actually did have about 40 devices connected, such as the devices that you named. And so, yep, each one of those is a potential vulnerability, or open hole into the network. And so, you know, it's all these kind of different devices. And one, it makes it just more difficult for the average user to make sure these devices are secure. When they connect, a lot of the vendors of these various IoT devices make it extremely easy to connect to the network because they want the consumer to have that convenience. They don't want them to have to go through a lot of security protocols when they connect it. And so I think that's one of the things just as a collaborative effort that some of these IoT manufacturers might look at possibly turning on more features than um, leaving everything turned off just to kind of help out with the process. And that totally makes sense. Um, we recently got a new printer and it was really easy to connect to the network. Versus our last printer was like impossible. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like, I can also see how that also makes it more vulnerable to outsiders. And then one comment, you know, if the crock pot was a smart crock pot, I would totally buy it if it could then cook for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think that's what it's, uh, I don't think it was created for that reason. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. So this takes me to the next question is, why has cybersecurity become so important for individuals, corporations, and for governments? Well, I think because um, when we talk about organizations now, regardless of what the company does, the data that's there is so important. And it's the vast amount of data that gets stored. And we've moved from, you know, a lot of what organizations do now. And we've seen this this year with the pandemic and work from home, that it's so prevalent that it, information data systems can be accessed away from the office, away from where we 
traditionally might have thought, okay, it's safe because the person has to be located here physically on our premises. But now one individual might be able to monitor equipment across several different locations. You know, we're away from our house. You mentioned the garage door opener. We can check in to see if we actually did lower the garage door, which is a thought that I always have, you know, as I'm almost about to get on the interstate away from the house. I'm like, did I actually close it? So we can see those type of things, you know, remotely, which is great for convenience. Employers are able to kind of maximize in their workforce. But because this data is so dispersed over different locations, it's imperative that information is secured because if not, everything falls apart. You know, if we aren't confident that our banking that we do online is secure, then we're not going to have trust in the financial sector. And so it's one of the things we've embraced this innovation, this convenience of technology. And now a lot of times it's after the fact that we've realized, okay, now we've got to make sure that it's secure. So I think that's why it's just we're so dependent on data and technology now. And that totally makes sense. And if people didn't have confidence in banking, they wouldn't bank. And nor would they probably even deposit their money anymore because everything is so connected. And I'm assuming the sheer amount of money that just banks alone have to spend on security is just just mind boggling. We think of the financial sector, health sector, with there being so much focus now with telehealth also being an area that's heavily invested in now because of the same, you know, as a medical patient, they want to have confidence that this information that they're sharing remotely is secure. And that brings me up to a follow-up question. At the time of this recording, it's late November of 2020, so the election just happened. And so one of the news stories is like election security. And so here's a question is, how easy is it to get a computer to change a vote? (laughs) And I say that in jest because the U.S. government spends a lot of money on making elections secure. And so one of the things that some people are saying is like, oh, well, this happened and then millions of votes were changed. And my only response is like, really? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of conversation and there were a lot of conversations before the election coming up into it. And, you know, the the great thing about it is the vast majority of our voting machines have two things that are in place for security. Uh, One is their air gap, meaning those machines are not connected to an external network. So even if, you know, some of these scenarios that you could see somebody has showed that they've been able to, in a lab, compromise a one machine or, you know, a minimal amount of machines. Well, the first thing they would have to, you know, physically be sitting there with no one recognizing them in the physical room next to the machine. So if that was possible. So that's the first thing that would happen. And the next thing that also the vast majority of our voting machines also print out a paper audit or ballot of some type so the voter is able to see what actually was saved to the system. And so there's that that's an immediate audit trail that has that paper ballot that the user can either see or there's a paper ballot that's saved as an audit trail. So those two things make our voting system, you know, very secure with just those two things, in addition to all the other options that are there that you talked about, the resources that are spent on making sure that the technology, the vendors, the software, and that's that's another thing. There's not just one type of software, one type of hardware voting machine that's used across the country. There's various different softwares, different machines at the different state, local election boards you use for elections. And so to say, is somebody compromising the integrity of the voting system on a wide scale? We've done a great job in this country of making sure that's something that's really taken serious with security. I'm really glad you brought that up because each individual state um, operates their elections differently. So in my mind, I'm totally imagining like a like an early 2000s hacker movie where there's a montage of these people hacking, quote, hacking, you know, typing away at a computer and then they do something and then the entire election apparatus is changed somehow. But the reality is that each state operates their elections separately from other states. Some states might share certain software, different things like that, but a decentralized way of holding elections is actually a really good way of ensuring a fair 
and equitable elections. Now, again, as a follow-up, because we just had the elections, should there be federal guidelines or a federal system for elections? And would that put our elections in more jeopardy? You know, I think those are conversations that do come about. And, in, in, you know, every few many years, the conversation comes up is, what about Internet voting, you know, on a wide scale to increase the number of it? percentage of the population that votes and participates in the process. You know, I think they're great conversations. I just think we would have a long way to go to effectively be able to implement a system on a national scale in a secure manner and not introduce more risk than where we're at now. One of the other great areas, I think now that with our election systems, even inside of a state, the local election Sometimes county to county, they're using different systems. And of course, you know, that does um, introduce some frustrations. We're wanting to see immediate results across the state. The election ends at 7. We want to know at 7.15 what the results were. That would be great if that was an instant update. But, you know, I think having to wait a couple days, you know, a few days for results is worth it to uh, make sure that the security is there and we aren't risking the integrity of the voting system. I think one of the things that also came up when we were talking about election, and this is something that will continue to be a question even post-election of where we're at and not just concerned with election security, but our social media. Right now, it used to be that um, the majority of the news that we captured we turned on one of our local stations and we got our news from a trusted news source, uh, whether it was, you know, the two or three major news networks. And we were sure that information had been vetted and we could trust that information. Now, so many individuals, they've opted to cut the cord, may not have traditional cable. And so they get their news from social media, they get their news from the internet. Truly, we live in a world to where you can't believe what you see and hear with uh, some of the deep fake technology that's out there that can manipulate videos or audio or both. And so I think that's a big concern that, you know, if someone's able to manipulate social media and kind of um, change the perception of what has happened or what is going to happen. And that's a huge concern. I think that, you know, we see some of the tech companies are trying to address and label certain things that they've identified as uh, deep fake or altered videos. Uh, but yeah, I think that's something that will continue to be a concern. And I completely agree. Um, I think the 2020 elections have brought up many issues, uh, many issues that need to be investigated and studied. And a lot of issues for policymakers to address. And uh, we just hope that our elected leaders are able to address them. Definitely. Today, we're speaking to Dr. Kevin Harris. We'll be right back after a short break. The cybersecurity field needs versatile professionals to keep up with new and constant cyber threats. At American Public University, you'll acquire vital certifications, foundational knowledge, and the cutting edge skills to protect and defend your organization from harm. Start making a difference in the world of cybersecurity today. Apply now at study at apu.com. And we're back with Dr. Kevin Harris. And so my next question is, what do students learn when they get a degree in cybersecurity um, and then a bachelor's versus a master's? And, and I'll talk kind of in general, then talk about some of our students. And, you know, when we talk about cybersecurity, when students are wanting to enter the field, well, and even if someone has been in the field for years, the question comes up, do you want to be uh, highly technical or do you want to go into more of a management role? So I think a lot of times that's something that individuals looking to go into that field, you know, they may question themselves which fit is best for them. And so in particular, our um, bachelor's degrees, we try to give our students kind of a broad set to look at both, you know, to have uh, technical skills, but also that if they are someone that they might have um, had a career in tech or in cyber, that they're able to kind of couple some of those skills and go in and uh, work as team lead or into management to have both those project management skills 
as well with technical skills and the ability to interact with teamwork and group work. And I think on the master's levels, a lot of time we see individuals there that have worked in the field and they're looking really to take their um, next step up. You know, they're looking really there to go into management. And so I think there a lot of times and, you know, we introduce in our programs heavily focus on policies, um, some of the policy implementations that are there so that in addition to having the understanding of tech, but how does this work within the role of our organization? You know, what are some of the organizational struggles and structures that we'll have to overcome? And what about some policy or legal implications of some of the things that we do? So it's really that focus, that kind of double-edged, you know, highly technical versus is someone looking to manage a team of individuals that are going to implement these uh, new innovations. And all those make complete sense. And it really makes me think, I really like what you said about somebody who already has a degree or is coming back to get more experience with management. And it really helps me think about um, the communication in any role, and especially important in cybersecurity, because if like the frontline person is is working away and making cybersecurity better, leadership has to also understand those improvements and the threats to then implement those. And then how, how do you feel like uh, the role of education helps people really prepare for that leadership experience and working with, uh, you know, different leaders within organizations and and work with different stakeholders? Well, I think the first step of that is realizing that a lot of industry, especially cybersecurity, is really interdisciplinary. We all have this kind of thought. You talked about uh, old, old movies, and we all kind of remember those old movies, somebody sitting in the basement somewhere in the light, so on their programming on a computer. And so that's our kind of initial reaction when we think about someone that's a cybersecurity analyst or cybersecurity warrior, if we call them. Uh, But that's the furthest thing from the truth. Individuals have to be able to work with the other areas outside of IT. You know, they've got to work with the business units and they've got to understand what the organization is because even the best, you know, applied cybersecurity strategy If it's too strict, it it stops the organization from doing what they're there to do. It's not correct. A technique that's used in one organization or a decision that's made in one organization just doesn't work well with another organization. So that's why it's important for you talked about the leaders. And these are leaders outside of IT, other C-level executives to have some type of cybersecurity awareness so that they can understand uh, the risk. And when they're making decisions and when they're allocating resources, um, that they keep this in mind and, you know, so that they understand that when they're looking at resources, the fact that they haven't had a breach or a lot of times I say that it's because they don't know that they've had a breach that some, you know, that's one of the staggering things that we see about a lot of the breaches is they've occurred months, years uh, before the organization discovers that their organization has been breached. So not to cut funding, but a, you know, a, a leadership team that's not aware of the potential risk might choose to cut some of the technology funding that's there. So um, even someone in a business degree or any other type of degree uh, will benefit from having a cybersecurity background. Retail, there's a lot of data in cybersecurity. And when you talk about privacy, associated with retail. So I think it's probably the biggest thing is just realizing that IT or cyber doesn't sit in a silo anymore. It's woven in throughout the organization. And that totally makes sense. It, it makes me think of like if anybody ever dreams of becoming like a C-suite executive, you know, if they want to be work hard, get the promotions, you know, make the big money. Uh, one of the realities of that is that they will have to think about cybersecurity. Because if they are at any organization that has any presence on the internet, they will have to f- figure out how to <laughs> deal with cybersecurity. And they'll have to listen to their cybersecurity experts to make informed decisions on how to protect themselves and their customers. And that really leads me to um, our final question is, what are the job prospects in the field of cybersecurity? And what type of person typically goes into cybersecurity? When you talk about job prospects, that's one of the things is it depends on if you look at the cup half full or half empty. I'll start with the half full and then we can get to the half empty part. The great thing about the field is there are a lot of 
job openings in the cybersecurity field. You know, depending on the study that you look at, there's close to a little over 500,000 jobs in the U.S. alone, particularly in the cybersecurity field that are vacant right now. Worldwide, numbers are over 3 million cybersecurity job openings. So if you're looking to get into the field, it's a great field to get into a lot of um, job openings. So that's the glass is half full way of looking at it. The glass half empty way of looking at it is because they are these large number of vacant cybersecurity openings, organizations and governments are at risk of having these positions unfilled. And so it's one of the things that, you know, to make sure that we continue to be able to support the innovation, secure the new um, technology or hardware that's uh, being developed and implemented is we have to make sure that there's a strong pipeline of workers. And that's a collaborative uh, effort. You know, higher education, we have to do our part, making sure that we continue to have and develop new programs and have degree programs so that someone's interested in going into the field they have options. And again, that's one option. There's also other options to address this uh, workforce need. And one, one of the other options that are looked at is the diversity in the field. So when we talk about the diversity in the tech field in general, and cybersecurity is not any different, you know, um, women and minorities are um, segments of the cyber field or tech field that lag a lot of times behind the overall population. So making the field and as higher ed, the degrees that we have more attractive to women, minority candidates is going to increase the number of individuals that go into the cybersecurity field and then really helping out the challenge of filling all these unopened positions. So it's something that's, you know, not only the right thing to do, but it's it's a thing that's going to protect everyone in the whole global uh, scale of things of having more individuals in the field. And that's completely true. I'm quite amazed at how many open jobs there are <laughs> in cybersecurity. And uh, it is an absolutely wonderful field. And it's one of those things when you're looking at job prospects for the future, say 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050, and really into the long-term future, cybersecurity will not go away. Certain aspects might be uh, taken by automation versus AI, but people will always be needed to help with cybersecurity. And that's uh, one of the really uh, unique things about cybersecurity is that for uh, a long-term career, uh, there's plenty of growth and there's plenty of stability, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and so at this point, Kevin, and any final words? I've had a great conversation about cybersecurity and um, anything vital to say. I've really enjoyed it. I think the other thing is, remember, is there, it's not just one type of cyber job. You know, we talk about, you know, the program or the highly technical job. You know, we've got all different types of job, whether it's social media, whether it's management. So if you're interested in securing data, working with data, look into it and see if there's an area that you're interested in. It's a broad field. And so I just encourage everybody to take a look at the cyber field, whether it's for career or just for your own interest. We all have data that's important to us. Everything from our banking information that we talked about to our phones, pictures of our loved ones that we have on our phones, all that's important information that we need to secure. So I just appreciate getting a chance to chat for a few minutes. Excellent. Thank you. And I know I've learned that cybersecurity is a lot more than uh, the 1995 film Hackers. <laughs> but that's a good film. <laughs> it's a good film. No, it is. Um, it's funny watching it because you're like, oh my gosh, it's totally in the 90s. But cybersecurity as a field goes a lot deeper, a lot more complex, and a lot more interesting than, you know, like we talked about, people on basements hacking away at stuff. And that cybersecurity, as far as, you know, one of the cornerstones of the contemporary world is here and is here to stay. So, so thank you, uh, Kevin, uh, for a great conversation. Thank you. Great. And my name is Dr. Biron Mercer, and everybody have a good day. For more information about our university, visit us at studyatapu.com. APU American Public University